Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Kesher, we want to welcome everybody here today on this magnificent evening. And if we can, just give a round of applause for Kesher and the entire team that put this all together. Two years ago, two years ago, I learned the greatest lesson from a four-year-old. Two years ago, on a rainy Friday afternoon, very late on Friday afternoon, I had to run an errand in Brooklyn, on King's Highway to be specific. Probably the most miserable parking situation you can ask for is King's Highway on Friday afternoon, in the middle of the winter, on a rainy day. And my daughter, who was four years old at the time, was in the back seat of the car. And I'm looking for parking, and I'm in a major rush, and I have to go, there's speeches to prepare, there's places to go, there's people to see, Shabbat is coming, I'm in a massive rush, and I just keep saying, I need to find parking, I can't find parking, I can't find parking. And then I hear from the back of the car, my daughter say, of course you can't find parking, Daddy. I say, excuse me, what do you mean, of course I can't find parking? She says, you didn't ask Hashem. I said, what do you mean I didn't ask Hashem? She goes, I didn't hear you ask Hashem for parking. Abu's so cute. I said, honey, you know what? You ask Hashem for parking while I look for parking. And I continue to look for parking. And then I heard and looked in the rear view mirror as I watched my four-year-old daughter do this. Please, Hashem, help my father find parking. And she looked up and smirked and said, because he's in a very big rush. Not two seconds later, a gray Nissan Altima pulls out of the right-hand side at East 5th, pulls away, and I slide into a beautiful parking spot. What's remarkable about the story, and why do I repeat it? Maybe you could learn a lesson, the power of prayer. Maybe some other rabbi will give that. But here's what I took out of that incident. The sincerity of a four-year-old having a relationship with God that was so intimate that she felt that she could just ask Hashem for parking for her father that was in a rush. Tonight, our goal is to turn back the clock to when we were little kids. When we believed in Hashem in that way, with that authenticity and that sincerity. You're going to hear, I would assume and I would imagine, based on history, some magnificent nuggets and golden pieces of information tonight. And I implore everyone here to cherish each and every word. Tonight, you're going to hear first, before the panel, a few words from the rabbinical leader of Kesher. But first, here's a little bit of what Kesher and Rabbi Joey Haber and his team have been up to. Girls, we really want to thank you very much for being here tonight. I want to say a few thank yous and then we'll go right to what the program is supposed to be. First of all, I want to thank Mrs. Rena and Ellie Cohen. We called them and in one minute they opened up their home, allowed us to do whatever it takes, move the furniture, set up all kinds of things, and they were incredibly, incredibly wonderful hosts and hostesses. By the way, do you have the name? Yes, thank you. There you go. Are the names of the, the belief card? Also, I want to thank the people that helped put this thing together. Mrs. Cheryl Shehebar does an incredible amount of work for Kesher. Ms. Sophia Shabbat, Ms. Julie Terzi, and a whole team of girls that were all involved that I don't have in front of me the list of all of them. But there's one person that made this whole thing happen. This one person made sure to watch it from A to Z like it was her own little baby. And that is Miss Tina Cassatt. I also want to thank the Kesha teachers that are here tonight. Mrs. Sylvia Scava, Mrs. Jacqueline Balciano, Ms. Sula Mermelstein, Ms. Rebecca Jamal, Ms. Frida Barnathan, Ms. Claire Nahum, Ms. Sophia Ozeri, Ms. Sarah Shalom. Ms. Esther Sarway and Ms. Nina Hittery, all of you, many of you girls are part of their classes. And if you're not, hopefully by the time the night is done, you'll sign up for one of them. 
I want to tell you what we're trying to accomplish tonight very briefly. About two weeks ago, there was a major, major asifa of 20,000 women in Newark, New Jersey, in the Prudential Center. It was women from Lakewood, from Muncie, from Passaic, and, other, and from Brooklyn, all across the from Jewish world. And at that asifa, they had a dais of about 10 or 12 of the greatest gedolim in America, Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky and many others. And when I heard about this dais, I said to myself, there's something so inspiring about these rabbis being here. These rabbis all have to drive far to be here and to honor the woman of our nation. Most of them weren't speaking, but just to show respect to the topic and respect to the women that are holding up our people. I think the beauty of tonight is that you have four rabbis, the three panelists and the moderator, Rabbi Meyedid, Rabbi David Asher, myself, and my brother Rabbi David, who are all here first and foremost to show you how important you are. This backyard is hosting the future of our community. This backyard is full of inspired girls. And we as rabbis are incredibly proud of everyone who's here. And we're incredibly proud of how inspired you are. Every one of the people that's going to be sitting on these chairs in a minute agreed in a second to be part of it because they wanted to honor you. And so before you get any message, get this message, how much you matter to rabbis that are incredibly involved in the highest places in our community. And I'm going to end with a little thought. In our parasha, the Jewish people, there are snakes that are biting them and killing them. And Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, make a copper snake and put it on a stick. And whenever they look up, they'll be looking up to Shamaim and they'll be healed. And the question is, why do you have to take a snake of all things? If you want them to look up at Shamaim, put a stick with an arrow, look up. Why the snake? I think the answer is this. The message of that snake is the same snake that's the lowest animal, the same snake that's killing people. That same snake can be the source of your greatest faith and your greatest inspiration because that's how life is. The same situation you're in that you think is hurting you, that you think is bringing you down, that you think is cause for anxiety and stress, the same situation that, thinks, that you think is the reason for your lack of emunah, if it's painted and presented the right way, can be the source of your emunah. The same snake that's here can point you there. The same situation that you think is bringing you down can be the one to bring you up. And so the three panelists tonight, our goal is to allow you to see that. And to allow you to see Hashem in whatever snake you feel like you're dealing with. And now, we're going to hand over the stage to Rabbi David, and I'll call up the panelists, and we'll begin. Rabbi David, come on. Okay. I'm going to ask two questions, I mean perhaps a little more, to begin the panel. This is the feature presentation. This is hopefully what you all came here to see tonight. To start, I'm going to ask two very simple questions that I can ask with some level of confidence because I know, God bless our community and this crowd, what the answer is going to be. I need audience participation. So please, raise your hand if you affirm what I'm about to say. Who here believes in God? Who here believes that Hashem controls every single element of our life? Good. Great. So now we can shut down. Great. Fantastic. You had your cookies and we could all go home. <laughs> Except not yet. Because I have some other questions for you. Who here gets nervous? Who here gets worried? 
who here gets concerned, who gets frustrated, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. How come? If you answer the first two questions with such conviction, then how come we can't answer the other ones in kind? The answer is it's not that simple. And so that's why we have what I believe to be the three preeminent figures in the community to answer the questions that we're going to pose tonight. And to say that this is an honor is an absolute understatement. We have, first I'd like to call up a rabbi who has written books that have literally spanned the entire globe, someone who can speak acutely on the subject of Emunah. Please welcome Rabbi David Asher. As well, we welcome As well, we welcome to the stage a rabbi who just hearing him talk puts us in a state of tranquility. He's the one who actually wrote the book, The Power of Tranquility. I'd like to welcome the rabbi of Shad Etzio and the Rosh Yeshiva of YDE, Rabbi Meir Yedid. And of course, I want to welcome the rabbinical leader of Kesher, Rabbi Joey Haber. Okay, rabbis, we're going to delve right into it. And girls, if I can again suggest that you keep everything in mind. If you have notes, write them. This is not just a puff conversation, it's not just fluff. We're going to get into certain concepts and we're going to get deep, hopefully. I'd like to begin with a fundamental question of Emunah. And that fundamental question is this, Rabbi Haber, we are hearing all the time, all day long, that we need to have bitachon, we need to have emunah, we need to believe in God. It's something literally we hear probably every other speech. Maybe even someone from you, right? We hear them a lot. I have a question. We also hear at the same time the idea of hishtadlut, of putting in our effort. Rabbi, where's the balance? How do you understand where my emunah has to take off and where my hishtadlut needs to surge and where one needs to put to rest and the other one needs to rise. It's confusing and it's complicated. Where, where's the balance? Thank you for the question. I think there's an important Pasuk in Mishle that answers this concept. And I think every person has to have it in their head. How far do I work? How much do I work? Do I work hard? Do I work harder? Do I work very hard? The reality is, that the rabbis that are speaking to you on the stage that are talking about emunah work incredibly hard. So is that a lack of emunah? Here's the pasuk. The pasuk says, Birkat Hashem hi ta'ashir. The beracha of Hashem is what brings wealth, is what brings success. That part of the pasuk, everyone in this room knows that idea. But the pasuk then concludes, Velo yosif etzev ima. And therefore don't add etzev ima. The pasuk, don't add etzev with it. Pasuk doesn't say, therefore, don't work hard. Doesn't say, therefore, don't focus. Doesn't say, therefore, don't strategize. It says, therefore, you shouldn't have etsev ima. Etsev means frustration and depression and anxiety. Doing a lot of work and leaving the, the results up to Hashem is what we're here to do. But when that lot of work includes in it frustration and anxiety and depression and anxiousness, that's when you cross the line. That's when you know that you think it's all about your work and you're not trusting that he's the one who's delivering the results completely. So how do I know Birkat, that you believe Birkat Hashem Hita Hashir? How do I know that you believe Hashem is the source of your wealth completely and entirely? Not if you don't work hard, still work hard. But if your work has a lot of etzev in it, if it has a lot of frustration and anxiousness, then that means you're not believing. Can I tell you one, one little story and then we'll turn it over to the next panelist? There was once a man who was passing a field and he sees two men and one man is digging and the other one is filling the hole. Digging, filling the hole. First guy's digging, second one's filling the hole. First guy's digging, second one's filling the hole. So he says to these men, what are you guys doing? He says, well, we're digging and we're filling the hole. He says, I understand, but are you nuts? They say, no, here's what normally happens. On a normal day, one of us digs the other one fills the hole, but in between, we put in this, the third guy puts in the seed. Today, the third guy couldn't make it. So we're doing our job anyhow. And it says, the geniuses. If you dig and fill the hole, 
without the seed, you're doing nothing. So the same thing is with Hishtadut. If you're digging and digging and filling the hole and you're working and working and working, without the complete trust that He's the one that delivers, you're doing nothing. You're just digging and filling and digging and filling. If you really believe Berkat Hashem Hitashir, then work hard, dig and fill, but make sure you include the seed. The seed is emunah. The seed is a calm, tranquil trust that Hashem is the one that delivers. And if you start to live your life this way, with hard work and then stopping and trusting, you'll start to see incredible results. And you'll start to see how the beracha comes from Him. So if I work intensely, somebody here works intensely, there's no guilt factor in that, so long as the overriding factor in that working hard is what you describe. As long as when they finish, they stop and they acknowledge, it's totally up to him. Okay. Rabbi Yadid, I mentioned in the introduction, I mentioned the word tranquility attached to your introduction. Of course, it's fitting for many reasons. I think one of the biggest challenges that people have in their day is maybe not the big things in life where they say, you know, this must be up to Hashem. I think it's sometimes it's the little things, the nuances and the, you know, we'll call them the little bumps in the road that happen throughout a person's life and throughout a person's schedule. I think... The point of this following question, these questions are a compilation of ideas that came about through talking to different people and through them deciding what should be asked. And of course, we're adding our own nuances to the questions. But I think the question here is like this. We'll go throughout our day and we'll have, from the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to sleep, at least, you know, maybe 20, 30 little instances that just, we'll call them, aggravate us and they're essentially a thorn in the side of every single person, for the most part. How? Do I, do we, does a person gain that tranquility in the small little things that happen to a person to realize, no, 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 I can't find the parking spot, that's God. I can't, a, a cup of coffee spilled on me, that's Hashem. I got a parking ticket, that's also God. A hey, person parking, it's clearly you're seeing a pattern, it doesn't go well. But really, that's essentially the question, is how do I take this concept of emunah, which is big, and kind of break it down to size and say, you know, these small instances that are happening to me, that's also Boreola. Okay, so before I answer that question, first I want to reiterate what Raheva said earlier. I think it was Raheva. That um, clearly the future of our community are the people who are sitting in this, uh, whatever you call it, what is this called? <laughs> <laughs> this beautiful pool area. There is no question that men learning men doing whatever they do is critical but the future of our people is you young ladies and whatever it is that you do to help yourself is building the future of our entire community and this night is actually very important because of that the question that was asked before this question can i just Mention something? Sure. Is this like... By all means, no, 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 no and I think that's a very uh, frustrating question in itself. So even if I'm calm, but am I doing too much? And is there a point of too much? So I think the rule is that whoever you are, you have to do enough hishtadlut that the result that you're looking for is not going to be miraculous. Meaning, let's say I get a new job and I'm looking to make parnasa. So what if I work for half hour a day? If you make money working a half hour a day and you just started working the first month of your life, you're asking for a miracle. That's not enough hishtadlut. You have to work enough time for a person like you to be able to make money. So the same thing with anything in life. A person has to put in enough effort that the result, when it happens, would not be miraculous. That's the general rule of how much effort I have to put in. I don't have to go crazy, I don't have to overdo it. I have to do enough that the result will be within norm. As far as the small things in life that bother us, I think actually the small things in life are the greatest opportunities of emunah. 
it's very difficult to have emunah when we are dealing, God forbid, with difficult situations. In a sense, it's easy to turn to Hashem in those situations, but to have real emunah and to be calm and to be able to be positive in difficulties is very difficult. But the opportunities that Hashem gives us during the day of the small things, those are much easier to handle one at a time. It's like going to the gym. You can't carry 250 pounds the first day. But if you keep going five days, five pounds, five, 10, 20, at some point, you're able to lift much more. Life is not simple. Life has many challenges and some of them are very heavy. Marriage happens to be one of them. So challenges of life are not going to stop. The small things during the day should be viewed as the opportunities that if you could tackle these small things that are frustrating you, which because they're small, they're easy enough to gather yourself and be positive and be strong about the small things, it's going to build up where you're ready for any challenge that comes your way. So I think they're the opportunities that come along the way. So Rabbi Asher, I'm actually going to piggyback off of that answer. And I have a, a, the, the same question essentially I'll toss to you, Rabbi, which is, so how? I mean, Rabbi Yadid, I think, set it up beautifully in the sense that that's the opportunity for a person and once he can tag it. But how? I mean, at the end of the day, is a person's human. I'm human. I have uh, idiosyncrasies just like every other person. I have uh, inefficiencies just like every other person. So I'll see an issue and it, and it gets to me. Is there a mechanism, a tool, in the uh, six books that you wrote that perhaps you could share with us that, that I could that one could implement as they see that challenge coming their way, or as they see that challenge, as they're facing or dealing with it, maybe even here tonight, something that they're dealing with prior or post this event. In general, there's no shortcut in anything in life. What we're calling the, the proper reaction is the rabbis describe using the word bitachon, the more emunah you have, the more it penetrates you, and the more you'll be able to react the right way. So only after weeks and months and years of the same principles again and again, Hashem is in charge, Hashem is in charge, Hashem is in charge, it starts penetrating. It goes from your mind and it hits your heart. And then your reactions start changing. Your reactions are, people tell me, you know, two years ago I never would have reacted like that. But now, it's a different world because it's the constant daily study, the daily reviewing, the, the hearing it in many ways is what ultimately gets a person to change. In the short term, you have to know what the rabbi was saying, an opportunity that you have. The Chafetz Chaim says in one of his Sefari, Mahane Israel, he says the main standing of a person's next future world depends on how they react to the way Hashem deals with them in this world. So if you know how how wondrous it is, your response. I didn't know it was that important. I didn't know by me saying, oh, that's meant Hashem. I believe it's Hashem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to continue on happily. I didn't know how important it is. When you learn and you see how valuable it is to Hashem, it gives you that extra push to want to do it. And when you have that at son, it's much easier to do. Okay, so then to that point, so how do I calibrate my hopes and dreams? Let me explain. How do I not become a victim of my own success, quote unquote? Let's say I work on my emunah. And let's say a person works on their emunah and they read every book they could possibly read and they strengthen it and they're listening to tapes and CDs and audio and, and videos and podcasts and they're getting immersed in the concept of emunah, daily emunah even. And they're living emunah. And then what happens is, is I now start believing that anything is possible. Problem is, Sometimes a person's hopes can get dashed. So how do I calibrate that? I hear people say all the time, they say, you know, Rabbi, I can't pray anymore. You know why? Because I can't get my hopes up again and have them dashed. I just can't do it. I've been through it 10 times, 20 times. That's it. I'm done. I can't do it. So the question is, how to avoid this? The, 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 the answer is, hope is the essence of a Jew. We don't avoid hope. We love hope. Hope is a mitzvah. Kaveh el Hashem. The pasuk tells us, hope to Hashem. And if it's hard, hazak v'yamez lebecha. Strengthen yourself. Ve'kaveh el Hashem and do it again. 
Someone once went, a great rabbi, he told me, he went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, he was praying for something for seven and a half years. His whole life, all he wanted was this. He says, Rabbi, what should I do? Seven and a half years, I can't do it anymore. He told him, Hazak becha bekabel Hashem. There's no end. Hope is the essence of a Jew. You know who Hashem is. We know what He's capable of. He wants us to hope. It's a mitzvah like all other mitzvot. And if people say it's hard, it is hard. A lot of the mitzvot are hard. But luckily for us, lefum sa'ara agra, Hashem pays us according to the efforts. And when you say, you know what, I'm going to pray again, Hashem, and I'm going to hope that now I'm going to get married, and now the right one's going to come, and I'm going to do it for you because you asked me to, and I know you're in charge, and I know you could do anything. How beautiful is that? How precious is that? This is what makes our stay in Olam Hazeh what it's supposed to be, following the Torah, following the mitzvot. So we don't look to avoid hope. We love hope. Keep hoping. And if it's difficult, chazak v'yamez lebecha, and say, Hashem, I'm doing this for you. A couple of years ago, um, I was in the waiting room or in the lobby of a hospital. Just to the rabbi's point, it struck me as he gave the answer. And I saw a group of Hasidic ladies, very, very, very excited. And they were in the lobby, and they were very excited, and they are talking in Yiddish, back and forth, and back and forth. And I'm not going to lie to you, my, my curiosity got the better of me. It's in a hospital lobby, after all, I had to ask. So I said, uh, well, you know, what's, uh, what's going on over here? You seem very excited. I, was with, I think it was with my wife when I asked them. They said, um, our friend had a baby. I said, Mabruk. So, that, that's, that seems like overjoyed. So she had a baby, her first child, after 24 years. So hope, to the rabbi's point, is definitely a cornerstone of our religion. Rabbi Haber, I turn to you once again. And the question is like this. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to comment on what Rabbi Esther's comment, because there are definitely a lot of people who make that thing. I, I tried, Rabbi, I prayed, it didn't work. I prayed and it didn't work, so therefore, I'm done. That whole phrase is a complete mistake. I prayed and it didn't work means you have no understanding what tefillah is. People think I pray means and I'm supposed to get results. Like, like if I give a ticket, I get, uh, I, I get to go to the show. So therefore, if I prayed, I get what I want. No way does it say that automatic you pray, you get what you want. What happens when you pray is that you have an opportunity to grow. And as you grow and as you grow, Hopefully Hashem now decides, okay, you don't need this situation anymore because you grew enough from it. And I'll give you what you, and now it's time for me to give you what you want because you could go to the next stage. But no way does it say just because you prayed. Abraham Avinu prayed for a hundred years. Sarai Amenu prayed for 90 years till they had a good kid. Yitzhak and, and Rivka, they prayed 20 years till they have a child. They're the greatest people on the planet. On the first time they prayed, the first Shachari, they should have said, one second, I prayed. Nowhere does it say, and it's not worked that way, I pray and I get. I pray and I grow. I pray and I get closer to Hashem. That's what happens. I pray, I pray and I become a different person. I pray, I become more courageous. I become more faithful. I become more trusting. I become more optimistic. That's what I'm supposed to get out of my prayer. And hopefully over time when I grow enough, Hashem says, I put them in this pickle of not having money for two years so that they pray to me a lot and become different people. They became different people. Now I can give them the money they need and we can go on to the next challenge or next situation but it doesn't work the way that for some reason people have this in their head maybe because the stories they heard they have this in their head that it automatically works that way of course Hashem has it to be Lord Hashem has every single prayer but it doesn't mean that automatically because you ask for it you're gonna get it and if you didn't get it it means your prayer didn't work nowhere does it say that that's how it's supposed to be rabbis although I address each and every one of you with a question of course feel free to please uh, chime in at any time to answer something or to add an addendum or maybe even to maybe give a different perspective, a different point of view. And there are questions that we're going to get to that are a little bit more, we'll call it, needy. There are questions about dating, there are questions about financial situations, there are questions about jealousy, and we're going to get to that and we're going to sink our teeth into it, but I think that this is a fantastic primer as we continue to build in this subject. And Rabbi Haber, I have a question just, uh, just to follow up with that. Um, the question is this, is people, people think a lot. People, when they're alone with their own thoughts, they just think constantly. And the problem is, is people overthink. And that, that personality could be contrary and directly contradictory 
to the concept of emunah. How does a person who's an overthinker, which many people are, how does a person who's an overthinker reconcile with this idea of emunah and belief in Hashem? Okay, so it's a great question, and the truth is, in giving classes to women and girls, I think at times this question comes up the most. Rabbi, I overthink, I overthink, I don't know what to do with myself, I overthink. So, my simple advice would be to write it down. That means when you have something that's on your mind, write it down. What's on your mind? What are the things you're going to do about it? And then just, you're done. Not, I have to think, I think, I think. A lot of times you're thinking, 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 because you're like thinking about it, and every time you think about it, you're going to keep solving it. Write down the problem, and write down what you're going to do about it. I'm going to make these three hishtad lutes, I'm going to do those, those, these things, and how I'm going to trust in Hashem, I'm going to say Tehim, I'm going to strengthen my emunah, strengthen some things like that, and read daily emunah every day. I'm going to do these things, I'm going to do these things, and once it's written down, it becomes easier to get it off of your brain. I want to tell you a story that to me was incredible about David HaMelech. David HaMelech had a little baby, and the baby right away was very sick. David HaMelech was crying on the floor in sackcloth, fasting for this baby to get better. After a little while, he comes into his palace and the, the servants come in and they're not sure what to say. He sees on their face that something's up. He says, what happened? They said, he says to them, did the baby pass away? They said, yeah. So David now says, okay, let me take a shower, give me fresh clothing, give me something to eat. So everyone's like, Your Highness, David, this is in the Pesukim in Shemuel. David, David, you were crying before, now the baby passed away, you should be crying more. And David's answer to me is very important for every overthinker. David said, as long as the baby was alive, I was doing everything in my power to hope that Hashem would bring it back. Hashem decided the baby shouldn't come back. Once that happened, now there's nothing to cry about anymore. Now there's nothing, there's no why, why should I fast? He says those words, why should I fast? What he means to say is, is that I put in all the effort, and once I put in all the effort, then I am done. So when you write down on a piece of paper, these are the things, the efforts I need to do, these are the M1 I need to have, go and do it. And once you did it, now you leave it up to Hashem. The reality is, girls, there's nothing you could do in life more than your best. Just do your best. Sometimes your best brings you the result you want, sometimes it doesn't bring you the results you want. You just do your best. Write down what your best is. Now, a lot of times people don't do their best. Write down what your best is in regards to Hashem, and write down what your best is in regards to Hashem, and then leave it up to Him. David HaMelech did his best. Once he didn't get the results he hoped for, he said, I accept, and I move forward. That's, I think, the simple way to get out of the plague that a lot of people have of non-stop thinking, as if their thinking is going to solve anything. Write it down, do your best, leave it to him. Rabbi Yadid, you want to share? Yes, just want to add to what Rabbi Heber said, that sometimes the thinking, I mean, I think most of the time, is either about things that happened, that's what the Rabbi alluded to, or sometimes, or probably most times, it's worrying about things that didn't happen yet. And I think a person must realize that Hashem will never give a person a challenge that they cannot handle. If I'm challenged by something, it has to be that Hashem believes in me and therefore I know that I could handle it. Just knowing that alone makes my challenge much easier to be able to hurdle it. However, when I worry about things that didn't happen, there's a saying that people worry about things that 99% are never going to happen. But the problem is when I worry about things that never happened, so right now I'm not equipped to handle that challenge because I don't really have it. But meanwhile, I'm worrying about it. So if I'm worrying about a challenge that I can't handle, it becomes overwhelming. So like the rabbi said, if you just take every moment of life as it comes, 
without worrying about tomorrow. Today you're good. What's driving you crazy today is not now. It's you're thinking about tomorrow and what will be next year and in 10 years and in 20 years. And it's all making you nuts. If you would just focus on today, today you're fine. Today I'm good. I'm going to work. I have my friends, I'm going for lunch, I'm going to pray, I have a class. Today I'm great. But when I worry about things that are not here yet, that's what drives a person crazy. And I think when a person realizes that, they start to live the moment and not anticipate things that never happened yet. Okay, and I just wanted to digress for just a second. The organizers can make sure that dessert is passed around after the panel is over and not during the panel, if that's okay. Uh, we will continue. One thing, one, just one comment to what is saying sure. is that you're worrying about things in the future and now you're overthinking about it. What happens a lot of times is your overthinking becomes a distraction from what you actually could do. Because there is one thing you could do, let's say about getting prepared for a date, maybe call shots, whatever it is you could do. You're so obsessed, you're frozen, and you're so deep in thought that you don't move. If you stop and realize most of this is not in my hands, I can't predict the children are going to have in 10 years from now. But there's one thing I could do today that will lead to that. Instead of thinking, do something. And doing something sometimes is therapeutic to get you out of that thinking mode when you can't control most of that. So you're worried about your kids, like everybody said, you know what, if I go to a class today, I'm going to be a better person and likely have a better family. So let me go to class today, that's my move I can make. And then hopefully the results will come. But just thinking about what 2032 is going to look like is just going to drive you nuts. I think what's one of the things you learn as you slowly get older, of course I'm, I'm younger and less wise than the rest of the rabbis on the panel, but it's one of the things you learn as you get older, as you slowly creep up in age, you realize how little is in your control and you begin to slowly but surely just release and say, you know what, I, I, you strategize just as much, but you slowly, in the back of your mind, you go, I can you know, run as fast as I can, but ultimately, uh, you know, Hashem is the one who's moving the ground beneath me. So, I want to move Rabbi Edith to a different question and of course Rabbi, Rabbi Asher if you can uh, uh, comment on this uh, after as well. The question is as follows and I, and I think it's a very 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 critical one today. People if they were alone on an island generally speaking maybe with a couple of people that they were friendly with they probably could be happy and pretty content. The problem is when you start entering in people and stuff and cars houses and husbands and children and wealth etc into the picture a person can become much less content and a person becomes much more jealous how do I hold on to my emunah to combat that jealousy because I don't know unless a person is the biggest rabbi in the world unless they're the biggest rabbanit or rabbitsin in the world everybody has some modicum of jealousy in their life at some point in their life and the only antidote to that is really emunah. So Rabbi, how do I, as one, do that? As a person, see that. See that threat and say, you know what, I have my emunah. Stay back. So maybe I'll leave the emunah question to Rabbi Yesha. Okay. But I'm maybe skipping a step. And I think we have to think why Hashem put us in a world with so many people. You know, somebody asked me a question, maybe last year, two years ago. Why did Hashem make so many stars, so many planets? In our solar system alone, they say there's over a hundred billion stars. Some of them bigger than the sun. That's huge. That means every person could have his own planet, could have his own star. Why did Hashem make so many? I think perhaps the answer is that Hashem wants to teach us don't think you're around people in your life because I ran out of space. People think, why are you around people? Because where else do they live? We have to live, uh, there's a certain amount of real estate available. It's not like that. Hashem can give us own, our own planet. Everybody has their, imagine you have the whole planet just for you. Everybody can have their own planet and there'll be plenty to go around. Why did Hashem put us together? Because that's our mission statement. Now usually the mission statement has the positive and the negative. Why are we around so many people? 
Because our greatest hatzlacha, our greatest success, is from what we do for others. We cannot do for other people if we live by ourselves. It's not possible. So we would be selfish. We would just not be able to do for anybody else. We cannot help our parents. We cannot help our friends. We cannot take care of our children. We cannot be the great people, the great givers that we are brought in this world to be. So that is why we have so many people. But at the same time, everything Hashem gives us could be used for good or could destroy us too. It's if we look at people as the potential receivers of our kindness, what we walk into a room like this and we say, okay, what can I do for the people here? Let me open the door for somebody. Let me give that person a drink. Let me smile to that person. Let me pat that person on the back. If I look at all the people around me as recipients of what I can do for them, I'm going to live a great life. But if I look at the people around me backwards, and I look at them as people who are going to serve me, what can I get from that, Rabbi? What can you do for me? What can that girl do for me? What can that person do for me? And I measure each person as a tool for what I can get from them rather than giving them. So then it becomes a very difficult world because all of a sudden I look at the world not in the way Hashem gave it to us. The people around us are meant to help us, not to hurt us. I believe, again, the Emunah question, maybe Ra'esha could handle, but I believe that the more we work on doing for other people, the less we will be affected by what other people are doing. Because you have a different kind of eye. It's not so much what I can take from this world, It's what I can give to the people in this world. Oh, it's, that, it's what I can give to the other people on the stage. Perfect. Oh, I, very nice. There you go. So I think, I think that's a practical, maybe it's a little bit of a side angle solution of how a person can not be affected by all the things that are going on around them. Ultimately, each person can only live their own life and can only be happy in their own life. And that's an emuna issue. But I think one of the practical solutions day to day is the more a person is looking at others as subjects of their kindness, the less they will be affected by the negativity that comes from other people. Rabbi Escher, jealousy is inherent. It's, it's something that exists in the world. It's, there's no question. It's something that permeates a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of environments, whether it's our community, other communities, etc. Is there an emunah angle to this? For sure there's an Emunah angle. I just want to add something first in the practical solution. Um, like I mentioned before, the, the human being is capable of anything. If we know what's, what's the benefits out there for what we're doing. The Gemara says, uh, the Midrash says that when Hashem destroyed the Bet HaMikdash and there was an uproar in Shamayim and Abraham went and said, Hashem, save the people in my zechut. And Yitzhak said, in my zechut. And every single person Hashem turned down. Till Rachel Imenu came and said, Hashem, save them in my zechut. What was Rachel Imenu's zechut? That I, she says, if you look at the words of the Midrash, I was, I was with my sister at the wedding. I gave my husband to my sister. Velo kineti ba. And I wasn't jealous. Those are the words. And I wasn't jealous. I was happy for her. Hashem said, that's it. Everybody, no one had the zikhut except for the one who's able to be happy for someone else. Wow. That's the zikhut. More than Akedat Yitzhak, more than Moshe Rabbeinu, more than... Look at the value. That shows how hard it is. It's very hard. But to... Realize, again, everything in life is an opportunity. Hashem gives you opportunities. The neighbor's child got engaged. That wasn't an accident. Why, you're their neighbor and yet there's four people in your family not engaged? That's an opportunity. How are you going to look at it? For you to be able to work on yourself and say, what, what does what they have have to do with me? What, am I getting married later because they're married? But Hashem wants me to be happy for someone else. He wants me to be proactive. 
Aharon HaKohen, when he was happy for Moshe, he gets the Urim V'tumim on his heart. This is how we tackle anything. Look at its value. Look at how much Hashem appreciates it. This is what learning does for a person. They see the value in things. But the Emunah aspect is, is every single person came down to this world for a different reason. We're all here in a mission. The world is short. There's an eternity. And every single person is here to do their unique mission. And Hashem gives everyone what they need for their mission. And if I would have anything else, we'd be wasting our time. So why, why don't I have that? You want that? You have to come back. There was the famous mashal, the Chafetz Chaim once said, I'll just paraphrase it now because I don't want to take too long. But he said, there was a guy, he went up to Shamayim, and they said, you're not allowed into the next world. Why? Because you were arrogant, and you did the worst things to people, and you looked, talked down to people, and he begged them for another shot. And they said, okay, we'll let you come back down. But you're going to come back down as a wealthy, successful businessman. He said, no, no, I don't want that. Why? Because I'm going to be arrogant again. What's the point? Go down here, make the same mistakes, come back up. And he begged them. He says, okay, we'll let you come down and be poor. Thank you, Ashada. And he comes down to the world. And what is he saying all day? Why aren't I like him? Why don't I have money? Why don't I want? Shem says, what? Are you kidding me? You begged for this. This is your whole purpose of being in this world. If you could accept, I have, I'm here on a mission. What is my mission? I don't know what it is, but Hashem knows what it is. And He says, you need to be in this situation for a little longer. What does that have to do with your friend? They have different missions. If you understand, everything is handpicked for you, by Hashem, for your purpose, to fulfill your purpose. So you don't have to come back. So you can live in eternity. Then it'll be easier to handle whatever he throws you. Rabbi, I want to get deeper on that. I'm sorry to cut you off. I want to get deeper on that specific point. If that's the case, and this I think is point in point, if that's the case, so then why ever, and maybe it's a little bit of a cynical question, but so why ever pay for change? So never pray for change. Everything's the way it should be, and everything's exactly how it's supposed to be. I have my, quote unquote, my, uh, my mission in life, and this is what I'm supposed to be, so why should I, why should a person pray for change? This is it. The main reason why a person should pray for change is because Hashem told us to pray. He said, is a mitzvah, I want you to pray. And that's why we pray. Why do we pray for change? The Rabbi Haber said before, he said, right now, the best thing for you in your mission in life right now is to not have this. Why? Based on what you did yesterday, based on what you did last year, based on your whole picture, it is best for you right now, and Hashem knows it's best for you not to have this. But with a little emunah and a zikhut and a prayer and a crying and a this and a that, Hashem says, oh, now it's best for you to have it. Now because of what you did, your situation changed, it's best for you. Sometimes someone, that it would ruin them if they had money with the arrogance they had, it would ruin them. But they humble themselves. Hashem, I know it's not me, it's you. I know it's, oh, in that situation, you know it's me? Okay, now it's good for you. So, part of the reason why things are good for us is like Rabbi Haber said before, just so we can pray. So we don't, we're not going to make calculations and say, well, Hashem, if this, if that, you want me to pray for what I want, that's why I'm praying. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the rest to you. But I know you love my prayers. You love when I cry to you. You love when I ask for you. So I'm going to continue asking because that's what you want. And I know you're going to do the best for me. Now I'm going to let everybody into a little secret. Everybody on this stage prepares speeches in, uh, in one way or another. Of course, the rabbis here prepare uh, more and there's travel much further. But everybody here prepares speeches. And what you're looking for almost every single time is a great story. You're looking for a great story that's going to hook the crowd, that's going to capture the moment. And especially when that story is an emunah story. It's he believed in Hashem so much, etc., etc. You wouldn't believe it. Next thing you know, it got better. Rabbi Haber, I have a question to those stories. If I'm a listener, if we're listeners of those stories, we've heard hundreds of them. And maybe we've kind of traveled the same path and kind of invested the same kind of, you know, mental energy. But I'm constantly let down. What, is you, what do you say to that person? So to your point, 
we all tell the stories. All of us here tell these stories a lot. But if I'm being honest, I hate the stories. Because I think what starts to happen to people is they just hang on to the story. I heard the story about this person that was sick and everyone prayed and the doctor went in and did another scan and so, oh, it's gone. So they think, okay, that's how it's gonna work. I'll give you a little story where I saw the hand of Hashem. My, my wife and a few of my kids, my daughters are here. They were in the car at the time. It was two or three years ago. We went upstate for a Shabbat during winter vacation. And we're driving back and it's snowing outside. We're in a minivan. And as we're driving back, I forgot what's called the 17. All of a sudden I hit black ice and I lose complete control of the car. The car spins once, spins twice, hits an embankment on the side, spins across the highway entirely and stops on the other side in the snow. I would later find out that that embankment has like a mountain and a crazy drop underneath. The car stops. Again, it spun two or three times, full circle spins with all my kids, a bunch of my kids in the back. The car stops, I immediately look around to see my kids are okay. And as it stops, I see a minivan pull right behind me. Man comes out, he says, get all your kids and put them in my car. I said, who are you? What are you? What are you doing here? After a few minutes, he tells me a story. He says, my name is Mr. Engel. I'm a Hasidic man. There's no one else here on the highway. I saw your car spin. I figured you were Jewish. You know why? Because it was a minivan. <laughs> and he said, I pulled up. I was right behind you. I never drive an empty van ever. It's the first time almost ever. I, so I have an empty van. I pulled up right behind you and I said, let your kids come into my car and we'll go. I said, one second, well, the car's a mess. They had to tow it, the cops came. They're so glorious, they gave me two tickets. <laughs> so nice of them. And then they had the Hatzalah came, checked out my kids. We put all the luggage in the man's car. And after an hour of waiting, this Mr. Hasidic man, Mr. Engel, drove us back to Brooklyn. I said to him, what are you doing here? What's the story? He says, I happen to be on the highway right behind you. I said, but there's no one else on the highway. He says, I understand, but I happen to be the only person who's right behind you. And I was right behind you, so I saw you pull to the side. I came right behind you. I said, as the driver, it's a two-hour drive to Brooklyn. I said, what do you do? He says, you know what I do? I actually, I'm part of an organization that does chesed. What's the chesed that we do? If someone has a family member in the hospital, me and all the members of the organization will drive a family member to see them. So that means, let's say someone's wife is in the hospital, we'll drive the husband on the way to work from Brooklyn to the city, we'll drive the husband to the hospital, and this way we give the men, people a ride. I said, wow, that's fantastic. I said, so you do this? He says, yeah, I did 87 such rides in the last month. Last month, he had a car that had over a thousand rides. I know the story is taking long, but I'll get to the point in a second. He says, I said to him, one second, how do you, where do you work? I said, where do you live? He says, I live in Brooklyn. I said, where do you work? He says, I work in Brooklyn. I said, so how do you do the rides? He says, this is what I do. I wake up in the morning, I drive someone to NYU, then I drive back and then I go to work. I said, all this is free? He says, yeah. I said, and you're the person who happens to be right behind me on the 17, two and a half hours away from Brooklyn, and you're coming to Brooklyn right behind me, and you take my whole family? I said, Hashem, this is an absolute, complete, total miracle. There's not a complete nest. On the 17, on the snowy night, there's no one on the highway, the man behind me, right behind me, right as I spin, hit the embankment, come to the far end, is the man who has an empty van, and this is what he does, he gives people rights. So that's the hand of Hashem. So I told the story a few times, they made a clip out of it, the whole thing. And you get the impression that these stories happen all the time. And the truth is they do, but they also don't. Because I have a question for you. Why did, if Hashem really wanted to take care of me, you know what He could have done? He could have made no black ice, made me not spin, and then we just get home. Why the whole spin guy behind me? It's such a cool story, but it would have been much easier if I just got home. The answer is that Hashem makes those stories sometimes for Him to show us that He's here and He's in charge. 
It's not that he makes those stories because every time they come out the right way. He makes things happen to us in our life to constantly remind us who's in charge. Sometimes when he wants it to work out the way we hope, it works out the way we hope. Sometimes when he doesn't want it to work out the way we hope, it doesn't work out the way we hope. So don't let those stories be some, something that makes you believe that this has to happen. Like Rabbi Esher said before, those stories are hope. Those stories are reminders that Hashem is in the world and He's controlling what's happening in the world. Those stories give us strength, they give us hope, but they shouldn't give us expectation. Because expectation at times is false. Because no way does it say that because I pray, I automatically get what, I, what I'm supposed, what I want to get. I trust in Hashem that I'm going to get the best, what's best for me. That's what I trust. Sometimes it's that everything works out right. Sometimes it's things don't work out the way I hoped. But I have the hope that He's involved. The stories remind me that He's involved. Those stories give me, give me the word again, hope that He's always in control. But those stories don't mean that they always happen the way I hope they do. It means that He's always there. He's always watching. He's always involved. So when you have those stories, and if you pay attention, every one of us has stories like that in your life. When you have those stories, those stories should be a reminder He's always here. Whether He has a Mr. Engel driving right behind me, or whether he sends cops to give me tickets. The whole thing is him. That's the point of those stories. That he's here, he's involved. Not to create an expectation, just to create a hope. Upstate New York in a minivan, some vacation. <laughs> I, I want to switch gears for a second. But to Rabbi Haber's point, uh, one of the biggest Eskenaz speakers was once asked, he said, how does so many stories happen to you? Every single speech you got another story. And the truth is the same could be said for the rabbis in our community. And his answer, I think, was, uh, I think the rabbis here will probably uh, second this motion, which is, the stories happen to everybody. You know, the rabbi said, it's, just, it's my job to see them, but they happen to everybody. And so that's how he responded to that question, and I think it's true. Rabbi Yadid, What's that guy, there is, sure. we have a little debate here. Sure. Ms. Kassab believes that the dessert should be handed out now. Oh, the real problems in life. <laughs> now and she is runs the right joint. time to get... Rabbi, what's that Muna perspective on dessert? <laughs> if I can have... Okay, you can hand out the dessert, but we're going to continue another question. But just make it move pretty quickly if you can, okay? Um, and also, cherry, lemon, or raspberry is not choosing a husband. Just pick one and move on. Okay, good. Now, speaking of husbands, Rabbi Yidi, I have a question for you regarding this topic because it's actually relevant, I would say, to the vast majority of this crowd here tonight. When a person is dating, sometimes they're dating and maybe even they're engaged. And by and large, I would say the vast majority of people don't have incredible financial support backing them as they go about, especially the infancy of their life. What is a person's perspective when they're dating, when they're engaged, about that particular challenge because the truth is is that you enter into marriage and you're trying to figure out you know i'm swiping my father's credit card for the last who knows how long and he's swiping his father's credit card and oh wait now reality hits what's our perspective overall and a 360 view on the financial implications or the financial feeling vis-a-vis -a, -vis a person's emunah bitachon what have you or maybe it's practical when a person is starting out their life with someone else So I think that um, it would be best, like the Rambam says, that the person already has a house built and now he gets married and things are set up for him. It makes a home easier to, to, to live in, makes more tranquility in the home. But on a practical level, at least in our world, I think if a person is going to wait to get comfortable financially, you may have to wait an entire lifetime because expenses are high, very difficult to really calculate how much you're going to make and how much you're going to spend. So if we took the approach that, you know what, we got to just first make money, build a house and get ready to get married and to have children to fill them in although it would be a great thing to do, it's not very practical, at least in our time. 
And I think in our time, because that's the time we live in, what's asked of us is to realize that at the end of the day, Hashem takes care of each and every one of us. And each baby that's born, Hashem is also taking care of that child. Every child comes with his own package, with his own beracha. You see many, many people that will tell you that the beracha came when I got married. I had two children, the beracha came. I was able, to, I never thought I could afford tuition and I'm able to do it now. I never thought I could, I could actually do it. And by the way, it's not just in finances, in anything. It, it, can, can, a, can a young lady here who's not married right now take care of three children? Three children that are up all night and during the day and screaming and fighting and they have to go to the doctor and they're sick and you have to make dinner and and you have to take care of yourself and you have to eat and you... it's impossible I'm having a hard time many of us even as singles having a hard time just getting by our day right now right. with three kids on top of us impossible but when you have three kids somehow magically Hashem gives you the power to handle three kids. A person who has three kids, can they handle 14? 14, what? Four, yeah, 14. Could you handle 14 children? One guy told me I can't handle the one child that I have. He's driving me nuts. 14 children? Could you handle 14 children? Pro the answer is, right now, no. Because you don't have 14 children. But if you would have 14 children, Hashem would give you enough energy and patience and strength to handle 14 children you see in life it's not so much what you have that you think about it's rather what you're responsible for and Hashem will give you so the more responsibility you take upon yourself the more Hashem will give you so therefore in our world practically speaking a person should try to work as hard as they can to save up some money for their marriage a lot of times people waste a lot of money, whether it's on a wedding or on things that are extra and end up having to suffer. And that's not really so smart. You're working when you're single, so save some money. You don't have to have such an extravagant wedding. You don't have to have everything top, top, top. If you can afford it, it doesn't bother you. That's a choice that you have to make as your local rabbi. But if it comes to finances, and you need the money, be careful. Save the money and have as much as you can. But after that, you got to just jump into the ocean and take that responsibility on and know that Hashem, if He gives you a responsibility, you're going to have the tools to be able to afford it, not only financially, but give you the strength and the power and the wisdom to be able to guide your life and your children. I think that ties back into what the rabbis were saying before, which is we're so worried about what's going to come in the future, and our anxiety is shooting all the way to the sky about what's going to come in the future, but ultimately, as, as Rabbi Yadi is saying, it, those tools will be developed once that situation arises. Um, and I think just to add, a vast majority of people that are taking care of their families 10, 15 years into their marriage didn't have that set up when they got married. Most of our community was not all ready when they got married for everything that they had and that they built. There's a very twisty journey that happens along the way for almost everybody. So whatever you think you have set up, Hashem has plans, Hashem has different plans. So if you look around and you say, oh, everybody looks financially secure. First of all, everyone's not financially secure. But second of all, most of them were not really when they got married. And if they were, the reason why they're financially secure today is for a totally different reason. So to think that I got it under control, is almost never the truth. I think that's part of it also, that what, what you see, and maybe this is going a little off topic, but what everybody sees is not necessarily what you get. And these three rabbis can speak to it because they know kind of people's lives in a maybe a more intimate way than most people. Most people see a person in the street, they see a person by a wedding, hi, how you doing? Everything looks glory and, and magnificent. But the truth is, it's true. I, mean, I have friends that, that, that got married with, with quite literally, literally, zero dollars in the bank. I have a friend who told me the other day, is I'll tell you how much money I had in the bank when I got married. I had negative $20,000. Because I bought my wife's ring, my parents had no money, negative $20,000. I said, and then? So then I worked, and we struggled for a couple, of, you know, a year or two, and I worked, and I tried, and then I prayed, and then I grew. And Baruch Hashem today, he's very successful. He has business, he's got, mashallah, a bunch of kids, and he's able to pay, you know, uh, for all their needs, etc. 
And so, and, and that's the point. To, to both the rabbis' point, there's no question I can see from a younger perspective. They got, people think that everybody gets married with some sort of treasure trove of cash. It just simply isn't the case. Most people get married on the contrary. So I, I, I have a, a, a few more questions we have. And again, these questions were curated based on the thinking of, of this demographic and this age group. But there's a couple of more questions. Just to to what sure. just said. I sure. think another extra point is sure. that a lot of times the frustration of not having money is not for the basic needs. A lot of times it's because Good of Lord. what we see other people, that guy is vacationing, that guy is going honeymooning, that guy is going, he's, he look, look at the apartment he has, look where they're eating dinner, look where they're going. And a lot of our frustration is not even from the basics that we need. The basics that we need, we're going to struggle and we're going to make it. But a lot of times it's because we're looking for something that's grand and you should know and I think the rabbis here will testify that everybody that gets married to anybody is a price. Nobody's got everything. So the guy's got a lot of money, but maybe does not pay attention to Rabbi, it. to your point, I think one of the, the side effects of being a rabbi in the community for a while is something that like struck me, is that how many people whose lives I thought were awesome are really not. Like it's scary how much what you see is not what you get. It's scary how much what you think is wonderful. I had someone tell me last summer, she said, she lives in, everything looks the greatest of the greatest of the greatest. It says, I wish I could just live in my sister's house in a small little cottage. I trade my house and my life for that in a minute. I was like, what? Everyone knows about your house. She says, I, I'm telling you how I feel. So to think and it's daily that these kind of things happen. To think that you, what you see, if you could have a nice simplicity in your life, you are blessed. So to think you need to run after grand or I'm not saying it's not something people want, everyone wants it. But to think that that's what you need is a mistake. What you need is a simple beauty in your life. That's where the beracha, that's where the happiness is. In the grand door, sometimes it's as grand as it looks, but many times it's not even close. Sometimes to get what we want, we'll find uh, different avenues. Some people choose tefillah, some people choose tzedakah, and then there's the concept of sigulot. One of those that you hear often, and I know that uh, young ladies hear it often as well, specifically maybe in relation to getting married, or maybe a woman who want to have a child, or even men sometimes utilize this too to, to, to you know, gain an edge in finance. I have a question, Rabbi Asher. There is an idea out there that it's a sigulah of sorts, that if I pray for 40 days, or I do something for 40 days, then after that, what it was that I was seeking will be mine. The problem, or the challenge rather is, and the question, is that very often, the person will do that 40 day ritual, the person will follow that practice, and then nothing. What am I to think? Is it fake, is it real, what is it? Correct. There's no guarantees. There's no such thing. You do this, you guaranteed success. You're for sure going to produce. But what your feeling should be is, for the last 40 days, I said X amount of Tehillim. I washed my mouth from saying Lashon Hara. I learned X amount of Halachot. That was the greatest gain I could have gotten. Someone once gave me a mashal. He said, one, and this question, you know, they said, I did this in zikhut for this person, or I did this in zikhut that I should get this, and I, it didn't work. So the mashal was, they were having a shul raffle, and they were raffling off two things in shul. They were raffling off a house, and they were raffling off a bicycle. So they called the number, this one won the house, this one the bicycle. They called up the person who won the house. They said, you won the house. He said, wow. And he was, was quiet. He said, Did you hear what I said? You won the house. He said, Did I win the bicycle? <laughs> no, you didn't win the bicycle. Ah, the bicycle. You won the house. I wanted the bicycle also. Crazy. You say, 40 days. You didn't speak Lashon Hara. 40 days. You said the whole Tehillim. 40 days. You said Perek Shira. That's the house. You walk away. 40 days. Someone told me a couple of weeks ago. She said she's taking on all these things because of this problem with her, with, with her baby. She said, you can't imagine 
what this, these things have done for me. Everyone sees I'm different. I'm a changed person. I don't speak Lashon Hara. Two halachot a day. That's the main gain. That's the main gain. We can never lose focus of why we're here. We're here. The Segula. Okay, it's nice if I got it. But I grew. 40 days I did this. Let's do another 40 days. Let's do another 40 days. And yes, of course, these things are contributing to your what you want. They're providing zikhuyot. The value of zikhuyot is, is immeasurable. So yes, maybe you need another 40 days. Maybe you need another 40 days. Moshe Rabbeinu needed 515 tefillah. Maybe you need another one. But never regret. And never say, oh, I didn't get it. You got the main gain and be proud. So we have two more questions and then we'll cap it off with something from each rabbi. This is a question that I think is very important with today's day and age. And that is, there is a massive struggle in the world today, and maybe it's a little bit for a different forum, but there's a massive struggle today with mental health. And by and large, probably the most pressing issue in the mental health arena is anxiety. And people, even regular, normal, regular people, are dealing with very severe anxiety. Um, so Rabbi Haber, if you're a person, or if a person is someone who needs to be in control, and they have this level of anxiety and the struggle in their life. I think that those people, I once heard from a, uh, one of the top people in the field, he said anxiety has no redeeming qualities. He says depression, sometimes a guy will go, will hold himself up in a bed, he'll sleep it through, and people will feel bad for him. But anxiety has no redeeming qualities. There's nobody's going to feel bad for you. You're an anxious person, you're a person who, quite frankly, can't almost, it's difficult to live when a person's anxious without addressing it. So my question is, is to the message to an anxious person, what is the message to an anxious person? So I think the answer is this. There's two parts to it. There's definitely a part to anxiety that emunah helps. A tremendous amount. I know someone was talking to me the other day, he needs help with something financially. He's incredibly tight. He says to me, but Rabbi, he says, I am good. I listen to a daily emunah WhatsApp, I'm on, I'm on that program, I am fine, I'm happy, I'm great. So emunah definitely helps calm you, give you tranquility, and, and, and ease the anxiety. But if a person has a real anxiety challenge, to just solve it with emunah is a mistake. Last year, there was an event about this exact same time, the Torah Masara brought a few of the gedolim of the country, and on a Friday afternoon they had a little bit of a forum and a panel for rabbis. And a lot of us were in the audience listening to these great Gedolim. And one young rabbi, who we all know, got up and said, but I once heard from a rabbi of 50 years ago that everyone who has these issues is just the Yetzir Hara, and they should be, and they really have to just work on the Yetzir Hara, and that's why they have these problems. I don't think I'll ever forget the image. One of the greatest, one of the greatest involved rabbis in America today, Rabbi Elia Budni, who was just by your house, right? Rabbi Elia Budni got up and he started yelling. He says, Yetzer Hara? What are you talking about? He says, it's because of comments like that that we have the problems. He says, when a person has a clinical issue, it's a clinical issue. And just like if someone has the flu, no one just says emunah right away. And if someone has a broken leg, no one says just give, have emunah and solve the problem. If a person has a clinical mental health challenge, you need to deal with it. Sometimes you need therapy. Sometimes you need medicine. Sometimes you need a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Don't be afraid to engage in that. And that's not a lack of emunah. You have emunah, it helps. But if a person has, just like if a person has a broken leg, no one would just sit down on the floor and say, Emunah, give me Rabbi Esther's book, I'm gonna solve the problem. So if you, have a, if you have a clinical mental health issue, don't just say, I'm gonna have Emunah, I'm gonna solve the problem. Go get it taken care of. Of course you need Emunah. Of course Emunah helps to calm you down, to focus you when you trust that it's all in Hashem. But if you have a diagnosable mental health challenge, deal with the mental health challenge. And I'm sure there are girls in this, in this backyard or friends of yours that have mental health challenges that are afraid to address it. And they think, no, I'm just gonna read this book, I'm gonna go to this class, 
Read the book and go to the class, 100%. But don't just think you're solving the whole problem that way. Get the help you need. And more and more Gedolim across the country and more and more rabbis across our community are getting behind this idea that if a person has a mental health issue, they need to deal with the mental health issue and not be afraid of the mental health issue. There's nothing wrong with you because you have a mental health issue. Just like there's nothing wrong with you if, you if you break your toe, there's nothing wrong with you if you have a struggle inside of your brain. There's nothing wrong with you. Just address it. There's something wrong with you if you fake it. But if you just try to go and say, I acknowledge I have a problem and I'm going to do my best to do what, address it the best way possible, then there's nothing wrong, nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing to be shy about. You don't know how many problems there are out there in the world and how many problems there are out there in the community by all people that are smile to you. But they have so many issues at home. Don't be shy to address it. Get up and do something about it. And then, of course, you have emunah that Hashem is going to help you, that this doctor, this psychologist, this psychiatrist, this, this social worker, this person is going to help you through it. Of course you need emunah that this is going to be a solution to the problem. But just like Hashem sent doctors, Hashem sent these kinds of doctors too. And they're His messengers to help you get healed. Emunah combined with the right diagnosis and the right solution and the right whatever is needed, that's the right approach to it. I have one, we have one final question of the night. It's not a bombastic question, it's not one that's uh, fireworks, but it's a question that I think could help every rabbi segue into kind of their closing statement for the evening. And the question is like this, people, specifically, Kesha is designed, for the most part, to handle and to deal with the community post high school. And so, by design, it's dealing with, mashallah, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 kids in the community, 2,000 young adults in the community today. That age group, a lot of them, because they're not in the confines of school anymore, because they're not surrounded by their age group necessarily, and many people are taking different paths, you'll find that a girl, or even a young boy, can begin to grow on their own. Rabbi Asher, I'll begin with you if I can. And again, you can use this as a springboard to close off the evening of your statements. But how does a person who's growing on their own? There's a lot of people who are growing on their own. I'm, I'm, I want to get better. I want to advance in one area or another. How does a person in their own cocoon grow on their own? Which means how does a person have whatever the tools are necessary, whatever the mindset is, to grow, sometimes it's sometimes it's independently. Sometimes their families may be a different wavelength. Sometimes their friends are a different wavelength. How does a person find it within themselves to grow? The person knows, the person sees the truth, they see what life's all about, and they start growing. They start doing, and they're met with resistance, especially sometimes from family members, from friends and they feel the peer pressure, and they feel, I don't know what's going to be. We have to know every single person was placed in the exact background that this person needed to be in, also to do their mission. You have to grow in this background. You have to grow with the peer pressure. It's all part of it. It's all part of Hashem's plan for you. And sometimes we say, ah, oh, you know, I wish I was in this family and I wish I was in the, I wish I was here. It would be so much easier. Look how much easier she has it to be religious. You don't realize a, a minute of your struggle is worth months of some other people's avodat Hashem. Don't ever say, it's not fair. Why do I have this struggle? These struggles are what life's all about. Growing amidst people who might not see the way you see it but then when they see how beautiful you present yourself and they see what a kiddush Hashem you are they say you know what I want that also somebody told me a man who learns in one of my classes he says my son he went to Israel to learn I wasn't too happy about it but he came back he made a siyum in the house and all his boys that went when the yeshiva were there and I they were so fine and so respectful. And I have another son who didn't go to yeshiva. I, he says, I can't say it to him in public, but I wish the other one was like this one. Wow, what a kiddush Hashem. You turn someone from the way you act. Our situations, our family life, our friends, our school, wherever we are, it is exactly where Hashem placed you and 
feel that this is the place, from here is where I need to grow. And never think that Hashem is he's, he's pushing me away. Why does He make it so hard? He's pushing me away. He's giving you even more opportunity because when you rise above, like I said before, your avodah becomes so much greater than it could have been had it been easy. So this is how we grow. We know, Hashem, you want me here? You wanted me to hear that comment. You wanted me to hear that. But I'm going to continue. I'm doing it for you. I know you're in charge. I know you're taking care of me. And we continue like that. Eventually, if you act the way Hashem wants you to act, you're going to be a Kiddush Hashem. You're going to change other people. They're going to see the beauty. And that's going to be your glory. That because you worked, because you struggled, you became now the leader. Someone, I'll conclude, somebody who is a regular girl in the community, regular as could be. She says, I started you know, giving a chidush every day on WhatsApp to a couple of people. And then more people joined, more people joined. And I was listening to classes and I was saying, she says, I wasn't religious myself. But I was listening to rabbis saying it over, listening, saying it over. And now she has maybe 300 people listening. And she says, now I'm dressing more modestly. And up from what? From a little, a little divre Torah. It's, it's contagious. People love it. This is emet. It's the truth. Know you have the truth. Feel empowered. I'm doing Ratzon Hashem. And Hashem will help you. And you'll find the right person to marry. And you'll have the best family. Be'ezrat Hashem. And everybody here should always have Beracha and everything they do. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Yadid, independent growth can feel lonely, can feel isolated, to be uneasy. What's the rabbi's view? So before I answer that question, I, I do want to say that I don't know what the other rabbis feel, but I, it's pretty clear to me that on the 50 years that I've been on this planet, I don't think I've seen so much thirst and hunger for growth the people that are around me i don't know if it's everywhere in the world because i don't go everywhere in the world but definitely all the people that are around us here in this community which is where i am the the thirst to be a better person to be a better jew classes night like this is magnificent Everybody here coming out to hear words of Torah. Classes all over are full. Men, women, young ladies, young men. Even you see today, you walk into shuls, you see 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds. There's, there's a thirst for growth. So, something that we see today, I think more than I've ever seen. And, you know, if you think about it, Life is about free choice. And imagine everybody was patting you on the back when you're doing something good. So then what would be the choice? We love to be patted on the back. We love to be told how great we are. We love to be put in lights. So if everybody was saying, wow, you're growing? Awesome. I love it. Go. We all love you. You're going to put banners, you're going to put airplanes with your name on it. So then, what would be the free choice? Who said we would be doing that because we really believe in it? Because we really know this is the truth. We're doing it because we're popular. How many things do people do just for popularity? Even things to hurt themselves, they do it for that reason. So there's a reason why people are fighting you. It's because it needs to be real. Your growth has to be real. And the way Hashem sends you to make sure you check yourself out is that if when people are not applauding you and people are maybe harassing you, now what? Do you believe in what you're doing? Is this just a, like a thing that you fell into and you're just gonna go into it, try it, figure out, dabble with it? Or it's real by you? When do we know somebody's real? When we put them to the test. The test, when you're growing, is that some people that don't know you like that and people that you grew up with and maybe don't yet do that, they're going to look at you and say, hey, are you a Rebetzin now? You're a rabbi? I didn't know you are so religious. Since when do you do that? I can't believe it. These are all comments that people make. 
The reason why Hashem wants us to hear those comments is because He wants us to make sure that we're authentic. The reason why they're making that comment is because they're really threatened by you. Because if now you're getting better and I'm not, uh-oh, what does that mean? What does that say about me? It means I'm not as good as you. Oh no, let me fight you back. You're weird. Look at the way you look. Look at the way you dress. Look what you do yesterday. You went to class tonight? What are you, nuts? What's wrong with you? I have to make you look foolish because otherwise I look bad. So when we understand that, when we understand where they're coming from, and when we understand where Hashem is coming from, then all of a sudden it becomes this beautiful, beautiful hurdle in life. Hashem says, let me see, Abraham, let me see if you're for real. Give me your son. Let me see if you really trust me. Let me see if you really have Ratzon Hashem as your guidance in life. I'm going to make it hard for you. Could you jump it? That's the way it is. Whenever you get, like Rabbi Esher said beautifully, whenever you have that challenge, that person is worried about themselves and Hashem is worried about you to make sure that you're real and you're going to get really far. Just stay in the course. Rabbi Haber, to close off the panel portion and then we'll say something to close off the entire evening. But Rabbi, this issue and an overall message, please. So first of all, I just want to say a couple of things before we end just quickly. Tonight's night was dedicated in honor of the two matriarchs of this family, Mrs. Fatiha, Grandma Fatiha, and Grandma Mrs. Cohen, and two women who have built tremendous families in this community, and it's, a wonder, it's wonderful for this night to be dedicated in their honor. I also want to say thank you for everyone here, for all the girls. You came and you stayed. This was longer than we expected it to be, but I really appreciate and we really appreciate your attention. I really want to thank the rabbis for getting involved. And like I said, it was longer than they expected, but every answer, every question, every answer was pointed and, and focused and awesome. And I hope every girl in this room, or in this backyard, walks out with some really incredible ideas that you're going to incorporate in your life tonight. And like Rabbi Yadid said, it's really, I agree with what you said. I don't know if it's kind of feels like it's since COVID that the growth and the yearn, yearning for growth in this community is unbelievable. People you never expect, people you do expect, people you never even dreamt, it's unbelievable what's happening. There are girls tonight from, that graduated every high school in the community that are here tonight. And we're not surprised because that's what's going on in the community right now. A love and a yearning and an excitement. In fact, the girls that are not here are the ones that are out of it. Because that's what's going on in the community. It's in and it's exciting to be part of growth because everyone wants this emet and Baruch Hashem, our community is making it so available. So here's my thought to a girl who's struggling and we'll close with this. First of all, and just two ideas. First of all, that's what Kesha's is here for. We had the, the teachers are here with you tonight. You have a QR code you could put onto and you could join. If you don't have someone who's holding your hand through the process of 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, those years of your life, why? They're here for you. They'll love you, they'll care for you on your level, where you are. It's not force feeding, it's what you want. To have someone that cares about you and is involved in your life, it's such a gift. Utilize the gift, that's half the answer. The other half the answer is I wanna tell you something that I remember when I started driving and when I sent my first email. I remember when I started driving, I said, wow, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I don't know how I'm gonna drive. This is so scary. I got in the car the first time. At first you think you can, and then you make your first turn, and I turned into a bush. I was like, wow, I can't do this. And I remember the same thing when I sent my first email. Before I sent the email, I said, I'm so not tech savvy, I can't do this. And then in both cases, I remember what dawned on me right after that. I said, one second, Joey, you can't drive a car? There's billions of people on the planet who've driven cars before you. If they could do it, you could do it. Joey, you can't send an email? There's billions of people, by the time I was sending an email, billions of people have sent emails before you. If they could do it, you could do it. The beauty that you have in being a young woman growing up in our community in 2022 is that you know you can do it. 
because there are thousands of women in this community who have gone through a very similar struggle to you. I know yours is unique, but a very similar struggle to you. And if they can do it, you can do it. You can do it. There's more support today than there ever was. There's more learning than there ever was. There's more education than there ever was. There's more momentum than there ever was. You can do it. So if in your mind you think, I don't know, I'm telling you, just like when I sent that email, billions of people did it before me, I know I could send an email, and eventually I did. The same thing is true with you, that many people in this community have done it before you. There are thousands of women, not hundreds, at this point, thousands that have gone through a struggle that's very similar to yours and have overcome. And not just that they persevered, that the people around them accepted it. 90% of the time, the people around, it, around them loved it. Loved what they produced. Their midot were better. Their family was refined. And all of a sudden, the grandma or the aunt or the friend that was making fun five years ago turns around and she's your biggest cheerleader. This happens across the community. So if they can do it, you can do it. So if there's one thing we want you to walk out of this night with, it's the fact that Hashem is with you. Hashem is on your side. Hashem is hearing your tefillot, whether you got answered the way you expected or not. Hashem is watching. Hashem is involved. That should relax you. That should calm you. That should allow you to work, but don't work like crazy because it's in His hands. He's in control. Watch Him. Ask any adult who's gone through life, that will tell you the miracles that happen in their lives. So tonight, write down some things that you're gonna incorporate into your life going forward. Some changes that you're going to make in how you, your relationship with Hashem and how much you trust Hashem. But when you write it down, don't think that you're lonely in a room by yourself. You may feel in the moment lonely in a room by yourself. You may even be crying tonight. But through those tears, you need to know with conviction I can do this. And if you believe it, you will. Thank there are, you. There are two things we'll close out the night with. Both of them require a response of a round of applause. First of all, as I looked around this entire event, what struck me and what mesmerized me, and rabbis, if you saw, nearly zero people took out their cell phones to chat, to text, and everybody was super engaged for well over an hour. I think that requires a round of applause. That is number one. Number two is what amazed me, maybe just the same or maybe even more, is these are three of the hardest people in the world to get on the phone, let alone to get onto a stage tonight. And so please, as we say goodnight to the rabbis, I ask everybody to rise, give a round of applause and a standing ovation. Rabbi David Asher, Rabbi Meyidin, Rabbi Joey Aver, Azafu Baruch. Good night.